Good evening. Uh, our guest this evening is Charles Strauss. I'm Bob Carey. I'm president of the, of the New School. Uh, uh, Charles and I uh, actually met at uh, Jim and Barbara Freund's uh, uh, sitting in the front row, and Jim is, and uh, Jim was uh, uh, hosting an event uh, for our jazz program that Martin Mueller uh, runs, our jazz and contemporary music program. Um, uh, we just actually had a terrific uh, uh, event involving one of Martin's students, a woman by the name of Aaron Hall, who performed at a, at a book party that we did for David Lehman, who uh, just published a, uh, 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 a book about the, uh, the great uh, songwriters of the 30s and the 40s, uh, the Gershwins and, and, and uh, Rogers and Hart and Hammer. It was quite a, he, wrote, he wrote this book and then she performed all these uh, songs. So uh, that's where Charles and I met. I asked him if he'd be willing to do this. He was uh, scheduled to do it last spring and then had a flood in his apartment and couldn't get out. And uh, unfortunately, he didn't, this flooding outside, not inside his apartment this evening. And we're very grateful uh, that you're willing to come down and, and, uh, and talk with us. Uh, you know, I would say one of the great lyricists of the 20th century. Um, uh, songs that uh, even I out in Nebraska picked up and carried with me. Uh, <laughs> uh, we were talking uh, backstage. I, I, I asked uh, Charles uh, if there was anyone who ever came up to him in his lifetime and said a song uh, uh, changed their life. And in my case, it did. I, my, I'd say my last uh, serious visit to a hospital uh, after being injured in 69 was in 1978. And Annie, of course, had just come out, I think in 77. All I know is that I memorized and I, I could still and will not uh, sing Tomorrow. And Tomorrow was, uh, was, it, was an, it was an inspirational song for me uh, at the time. And I, my guess is uh, that I'm not the only person uh, alive today who would uh, say to you that that song reached us in ways that were uh, quite important and quite positive. Um, uh, in addition to me, Bob Bapone uh, is on the stage. Bob uh, directs our, our drama program. He's a member of the Actor Studio. He's a, uh, an actor himself, uh, has his own uh, theater company as well. He's a very uh, uh, busy and, like me, uh, one of New York City's geezer dads. Dad, yes. so <laughs> he has a, uh, a young child as well that he, that, that he spends a great deal of time uh, with, and I invited Bob onto the stage because he has a considerable amount more experience than I do uh, with the theater, and I thought it might be a more interesting conversation if the two of us grilled uh, you sitting in between us. So, uh, let me just start, uh, uh, Charles, just ask you, when did it begin? When did your interest in music begin? Uh, I think it began uh, somewhat unconsciously uh, because my mother, was a uh, pianist, a uh, jazz pianist. My mother played uh, stride piano, uh, and she uh, 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 she played very joyously, and that was uh, that was what uh, was around our house all the time. My parents did not get along very well, as uh, it was you know common, I guess, you know, we middle class uh, people, but uh, one of the happiest uh, <laughs> one of the happiest a lot times. A people have had that experience. Oh, time. yeah, really? <laughs> one, yeah. one of the happiest times in my life that uh, always stuck with me was when my mother played piano and they weren't fighting because we'd all stand behind her. And parenthetically, when uh, Lee and I did the uh, theme song for All in the Family and Norman Lear uh, wanted it to be uh, uh, set in chorus with orchestra in the back and didn't have the money, uh, I suggested something that we did at home, which was when my mother played, we all used to stand around her. And he had no choice because he had no money. And uh, that, became the, uh, that became the logo of the show. T tell us about Lee. Uh, well, uh, as we're talking, he's probably very happy at home having a martini. Uh, uh, and Lee is my oldest, I mean, he's somebody I've known for uh, 60 years now. Lee Adams. And uh, Lee Adams, excuse me. And uh, th that kind of friendship among men in my life certainly is not usual. It's quite rare. Uh, I'm not too good at making friends. But Lee and I have stayed friends. We're very opposite people. He's more laconic than I am. He is uh, 
uh, much more of a country boy than I am. Uh, he is, uh, I would say, uh, were he here, he might uh, uh, dislike the word, but I would say in our relationship, he was more submissive than I am. And I can say that uh, as I am, uh, say, submissive to my wife in one respect. It's, it's, a, it's a measure of, she left already? No, she's right there. Uh, oh, there she is. Uh, it, it's a way of, of, uh, of getting along in collaboration. You know, people will always say, well, how do you collaborate? What comes first and all? Uh, one thing you learn when you're married, uh, this is meant to be funny, but it was told to me as funny, when, you, when you're married for a long time, you learn that she is always right. And uh, I, I would say that Lee's, uh, uh, Lee's in my relationship, which is very tight, I, I'm, I'm a little more of a heavy hitter than he is. But he's the sweetest, nicest, most talented, uh, honest, uh, uh, a person that I knew. When you guys, when you work together, do you do you compliment each other, or do you give him space and then he t you get your own space and then you negotiate that, or does he have an idea that you then? How does the how do you work together in partnership to create something? Well, I, I think exactly what you said. We we uh, uh, he sometimes comes. Uh, one thing that he used to do which infuriated me, and, and uh, Lee is very extremely neat, and I used to smoke at the time, and when we were working together, he'd walk around, he'd clean up the ashtrays for me, and that, that, that bothered me. And then uh, he also, uh, uh, I would hang up the phone, and if by chance I hung up the phone, you know, the wrong way, he would change it. So I, I got in the habit, not in the habit, because it's, uh, I'm, I'm a little sadistic, I would always hang it up the wrong way uh, to see how long it would take him. Well, in his, in his, in his writing, uh, it used to annoy me that we would have an idea and we would think, gee, this is an interesting idea, and he would have lines and I would have a melody that we both started to uh, feel out in one another. And then when he would bring in what he had done, it was so neatly typed that I felt that it was, it was an act of uh, vengeance or uh, <laughs> certainly something that showed a very uh, a poor side of my nature to say, <laughs> I don't like that line because it, it was so gorgeous. And, uh, uh, the, but he had been a newspaper man. Uh, he was an editor. And uh, that's the way he worked on it. He still works on a typewriter. He's the only person I know still does, doesn't have a, uh, a computer. computer. Uh, and uh, he's a, he comes from the country, whereas I came from the city. I was born and raised in Manhattan. He was born and raised in uh, Mansfield, Ohio. That got a big laugh, and I'll tell him. <laughs> <laughs> You'll tell him it did? What? You'll tell him it got a big yeah. laugh. Yeah. And uh, it, 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 our, our natures are totally opposite. But uh, as I say, a 60-year-old friendship, we've had uh, many successes, some failures. Uh, uh, we've, we've stayed together. And we would still be together, except he uh, uh, did the outrageous deed of uh, getting married. Uh, when we were working together. I mean, I just lived, I would get up, couldn't wait to work. Uh, I've always been that way. I've had good teachers, and I, I, I just love writing music more than anything. And uh, uh, we, we would do it. We had a very happy life together, you might say. And then he got married. I, th I couldn't believe it. At 4 o'clock, <laughs> he, he, was, he was catching a train to Connecticut. And uh, <laughs> it, it was uh, the end of our very tight friendship, but we're still good friends. <laughs> tell, tell me about your good teachers. Well, some of them you wouldn't know. The man like, uh, well, there was a Burl Phillips. I went to the Eastman School of Music, a very fine composer who, uh, to whom I would bring an, another eight bars every week, and he would say, it's very good now, uh, you know, we'd play it over, what did you mean? He said, he would say things, you mean an E flat, you don't mean a D sharp there. And, and you know, it was that kind of academic thing, but uh, the love of music and the fact that he was a very good music, musician and composer himself, 
a man that in retrospect uh, got little recognition that he deserved. It was a, it was a, uh, a school that was in uh, Rochester, New York, and uh, there was a great tendency to get lost there, uh, with the exception of Peter Menon, who became a president of Juilliard, uh, who was a, a senior when I uh, first went there. Uh, I think one of the greatest influences on me, because I knew very little of the technique of music, was a woman that nobody would have ever heard of called Elvira Wunderlich. She was a very straight-laced woman whose respect for tones, notes, harmonic and melodic dictation uh, were sacred to her. It would, it would, uh, and there was no fooling around when she when she played a chord and we were to write it and uh, notate it, uh, it uh, she was a fiend about it being in, this, in the right position and the right uh, uh, area of, of the piano. Uh, and I, I came away first thinking she was an old, uh, wash rag of a woman in a way. She was an old maidish type. If there was anybody here who knew her, I, I mean it only affectionately, but years and years later, uh, I thought about the respect that she gave me for, uh, for tones, their relationship to each other. It was a sacred matter to her, and I think of her as being one of the strongest influences in my life. And then I had a teacher by the name of Bernard Rogers, a fairly well-known uh, uh, composer who uh, had an opera produced at the Metropolitan uh, Opera. And uh, I studied orchestration under Howard Hansen, who was a, a very, very passionate man about music. These people did not become well-known because the New York scene, uh, the League of Composers, Aaron Copeland, uh, the entire New York crowd kind of took over and uh, the Eastman School was considered very uh, provincial. And indeed it was in, in many ways, but uh, I, I had fine teachers there. And then I studied and uh, I ended up at Tanglewood studying with Aaron Copeland. I worked with Aaron for uh, three years. He got me a scholarship to uh, uh, France, where I studied with uh, Nadia Boulanger. So I've had very good instructors. Uh, David Diamond uh, from Rochester was one of my teachers, one of the best teachers I ever had, a man by the name of Arthur Berger, who in my book, uh, w which is a, 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 an insult coming from somebody like me, but I, I called him intellectually brainwashed, but uh, it, it, I meant it almost as a compliment. He's the first person that, that uh, 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 took seriously the uh, Schoenberg uh, school of thought, or I should say the neoclassic uh, 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 school of thought of Stravinsky, that, uh, that, that there, there has to be a, a, almost an explainable reason why a note follows another note and not that note. And uh, the brainwashed part was because I was also fighting to right freely, I was getting more and more tight. And uh, David Diamond did a great deal to free me, and Arthur did a great deal to instruct me uh, about certain, uh, I don't know the word, certain rationale, proclivities that, that music might have. And uh, by the way, I, I wanted to say this, if, if I were given an opening remark, that before all of this, uh, there was the new school for me because uh, when I first got out of uh, uh, college, uh, I was making no money and, uh, and I was playing in, in uh, joints uh, and non-union jobs. If there are musicians here, I apologize. <laughs> uh, I was, uh, and my father in, I thought, who was a, a didn't know that much or anything. There was a big advertisement in the New York Times, uh, and uh, he said, look, he said, there's a, uh, there's a place called the New School where they, they have a course on film music. Now, at that time, today, at all the schools, including Eastman, there's a big film department. Everybody writes film music and learns how to 
you know, cut film or what it, what it uh, entails. Uh, and, uh, but I had never done it. And so I saw this article and, and uh, I was working at a, uh, on a string quartet at the time and, and uh, it was really a very, very sad uh, adolescent, I guess. And I went, to, uh, I went to the new school. It was my first experience and worked with a man who was a, uh, uh, he was just a, he was, he was thunder and lightning, a man by the name of Jack Shandlin. I've always been grateful. And he was musical director of 20th Century Fox in New York. They wrote The March of Time. And I was the only one in the class who had any experience in music. Most of the uh, kids, I think, you know, thought they were going to meet Betty Grable or something. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't have minded that either. But uh, uh, he uh, thought that I was able to orchestrate, which I was, and I, I was a composer. And he took me on, and he gave me a job, and I wrote music for uh, Movie Tone News, which is before <laughs> many of your times. And uh, uh, it was a tremendous training for me. I wrote uh, Australian Aquabells on Parade, uh, <laughs> Koreans <laughs> March to War, uh, 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 things like that. Uh, uh, these were sections and they cut it up. And uh, the, uh, the instruction was you know, that there should be a lot of harp glissandos. Everything was doubled so that they could cut, uh, uh, if they didn't want the trumpet solo, that was easily taken out, or indeed the whole thing could be left on solo violin, and the Australian aqua bells would swim to that. Uh, uh, and uh, played by superb musicians from the Philharmonic uh, Orchestra in New York, and uh, uh, Jack was a real, and everything was conducted very quickly because the scale was very high, and that was the new school. <laughs> So, so you, you graduated. You graduated Eastman with a degree, um, bachelor of music. Bachelor of music, and then my question is, how how did the degree training prepare you for obviously a, an eclectic career? I mean, what were you able to transfer, or how how did the training, or how did those teachers bring to you your voice, so that you then created from that, and how did the professional world affect you? I think it came from my mother, her her uh, love of uh, jazz and pop music. Uh, I, uh, when I got out of school, uh, to support myself, I, as I mentioned before, I, I started taking jobs. Uh, at, I, I would play, uh, there'd be a pickup band that was going to the Catskills or something, and, and the, the, I would be usually third or fourth online, but the union said, you know, uh, looking for a piano player. And, mm -hmm. and I played a lot of uh, gigs like that, and, uh, uh, I started to play jazz. And then to support myself in New York, I started to accompany singers, many singers. You mentioned the actor studio before. I used to be Lee Strasberg's uh, pianist down there. Wow, really? Uh, yeah. Uh, there was a time that at the actor studio, there were shows like My Fair Lady going on, and uh, actors now so that saw that there were big bucks to be made, and that serious actors, Rex Harrison, you know, would play in them. So they, they started to get interested in it. And Strasbourg, I was a pianist around town, asked me to become the pianist there. And uh, I would work with, uh, uh, let's say, Anne Bancroft and uh, I forget who that, uh, uh, some other big actor on uh, My Fair Lady. We would do a scene from My Fair Lady and then they would do it in front of uh, Mr. Strasbourg and he would criticize it. And uh, I didn't agree with half of the things he said, but <laughs> I, uh, Marilyn Monroe was, uh, uh, was, was there. Yeah. And they would all do scenes from uh, shows where they felt that they would be creditable. And uh, it was an interesting experience. He ran the show. He was a very uh, opinionated kind of guy. But uh, I not only met a lot of people, but uh, you know, I learned a lot about what actors need to get up there. Can you, can you, again, backstage we were talking, I asked you the question about when you're, when you're, when you're composing, do you, do you think about the audience? What kind of a, what, what, what goes through your mind when both you and Lee were working together to, to, to put songs together? And you talked about, you know, uh, some, some things backstage. I'd just like to put it to you one more time and perhaps you could show us on the piano uh, what, 
you know, what you mean when you're thinking about what the impact would be on the audience? Well, uh, I think you think of the, uh, the logic, first of all, the, uh, the storyline. There is a, uh, there's very often a, uh, I mean, I'm not answering this uh, well, I don't think, but. It wasn't asked very well either. So <laughs> it wasn't asked very well either. So. <laughs> There, there, there's a kind of conflict between somebody who is a playwright and has not, uh, doesn't deal in music. Uh, they think of time, the use of time differently uh, than, a, uh, than a composer will. Uh, uh, right, right now, I'm, I'm, uh, I have been working on a, uh, 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 a musical that Lee and I wrote based on an American tragedy, uh, a book that everybody, we all read in college. And uh, uh, Lee and I finally finished a musical on it. And then the Metropolitan Opera Company asked us to, to buy up our rights in it. And, and uh, the co-author had died. But uh, there's a need that I have to fill the time with music, and I'm not saying that correctly, but that is that a, 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 a man doesn't have to say, uh, I am uh, uh, going down to the firehouse uh, because I love to see, I love to see uh, the fire engines leave and the, 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 the shouts of the firemen and the excitement and the sirens. Uh, whereas my tendency, and obviously I'm improvising, but my, my tendency is to uh, try and reflect something of that uh, motion and excitement in music that would happen before this beautifully written scene that the playwright may have written about uh, how he grew to love watching the firemen. Uh, and, and there is a, within some, uh, we, we wrote Golden Boy with Clifford Odets, and Clifford, who was one of uh, uh, the great playwrights uh, of America, in my opinion, uh, Clifford could not see a scene uh, without seeing all of the, uh, uh, the grit and the background of, a, uh, of an actor, uh, his, his, uh, 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 where he came from uh, socially, and uh, uh, the kind of language he would use. Whereas Lee and I uh, had a tendency to, uh, uh, to just let, uh, uh, well, let's say in, in Golden Boy, uh, I hadn't meant to talk about that particularly, but there was one scene that, that, uh, that uh, uh, was very important to Clifford in the show, and it was quite beautiful where the two lovers are talking about th their place in life and their ambitions, and the traffic light flashed red and green every, you know, whatever, 20 seconds. And it was beautiful, and he loved that. And uh, we, uh, uh, we, had another idea. We had a song that we had in mind where uh, he would talk about uh, uh, his loneliness uh, in, in a way that seemed particularly adaptable to what music can do, a kind of nocturnal thing. Uh, and uh, we had to uh, we had to fight with Clifford a great deal. Clifford was a very difficult but wonderful man, a man I, I greatly admire, a man who gave up his political beliefs for money and fame and sex and all that kind of thing, and knew he was doing it. He was, a, he was the kind of guy, you know, he wasn't even a good wastrel in a way. He, was, he, he did it badly. He was, uh, he would, uh, you know, he, his, his life became riding, flying in Danny, Cl Danny Kay's plane to Las Vegas and having sex with a young chorus girl. And he was a man who had, you know, written Waiting for Lefty and whose political and moral standards were of the highest and uh, who had never had any money and who now his greatest thrill 
I mean, I can understand this too, was walking around with $500 in his pocket. And, uh, but nevertheless, he wrote the most brilliant dialogue and uh, by digging, 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 got people to say, I don't know if any of you know any of his plays, but uh, the, uh, the way they speak is, is musical. And he was very musical. What song, what song came out of that? What? What song came out of that? Uh, I was thinking specifically of a song that we wrote for a golden boy called the Night Song, which uh, uh, was something we felt the young man, uh, it was a, 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 a black version, black and white version of Golden Boy, uh, which had not been the original uh, intent of his play. And uh, uh, we felt that, that uh, 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 a man, you know, you're entitled sometimes to, to start a thought, and if you're singing, you can, you can kind of step forward. I mean, there are different uh, uh, permissions given you, uh, whereas his scene was very tightly constructed on them talking to one another. And it's true, the director may say, look, this is so intense, you get up and, 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 and you turn your back on her and say, well, this is what I wanted. Well, we, we took that kind of liberty with music, and uh, that was one song. We wrote another song. I don't know if any of you uh, know Golden Boy, although it was, a, I, I thought, a wonderful show. With I, can I, I have to interrupt you, because I have to tell you, I saw the show, and it, it, to this day, is still the best overture I have ever witnessed oh, in my entire life. Thank you. And my question to you is, how did you conceive that? I mean, how did that come about? If those of you who didn't see it, it's primarily in the gym. Yeah. There's a lot of sound effects, yeah. the bag, the muscle bag, the, the slide of the shoes on yeah. the floor. Yeah. And it was very rhythmical, and it established the world, as I remember, unequivocally, and yeah. at the same time it was music, something I'd never heard Can before. We, uh, I do want to try it to was, get you uh, to go to the piano and sure. show us how you oh, Well, I something. can't do that. Well, that one I can't, but I, I mean, because it's all, it's all about, uh, but I remember playing it, uh, for, I said, look, we have an idea for how to start the show. And he said, okay, play it for me. Sammy was very, uh, and I said, well, this is, uh, it's, uh, it's hard to play for me, and, and Sammy was always somebody who broke up. Sometimes when he, he used to break up at things I said, I didn't say anything funny. He ah, John, that's a funny <laughs> thing. Uh, but this one was particularly difficult because I, I went to him one day and I said, well, okay, I have to show you sooner or later. So I said, uh, I sat at the piano and I went, <laughs> don't swallow the mouthpiece. <laughs> He said, wait a second. <laughs> he didn't say, I paid you guys to write music, but uh, uh, that was the implication. And it turned out to be quite wonderful oh, because gosh. he had a, uh, a bongo, uh, conga player. What's a bongo? A bongo player, a Cuban guy who, I tell you, could have made this thing here so exciting, even though we're just saying, hi there, Bob, and all of that. I mean, he was, you, you couldn't sit still. So that, that helped a great deal. But we had a bunch of guys. We had a, a wonderful choreographer. Uh, what was, uh, who, uh, who choreographed Golden Boy? Don? Many people. No, no, go, uh, Golden Boy. No, the choreographer was. Who? Donnie McHale, Donald yeah. McHale. And uh, thank you. <laughs> And uh, by the time we put it together, we wrote it all out, you know, with little expressions of uh, uh, $50 every fight, $50 every fight, you know. But we put it to, uh, to punches and, and we used the, the boxing bag. And we got a great deal of background because uh, 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 Clifford and Lee and I went up to Harlem and met many boxers, uh, which is, was a big thing in my life, but, uh, so that was that one. Right. The other song, Night Song, what? Why don't you play Night Song? Okay. My, my wife. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> Some of these things. Uh, uh, so, 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 so
ok. Summer. Summer. I'm sorry. Summer. Summer. Ok, sorry. Summer. Not a bit of breeze. Neon signs are shining through the tired trees. Lovers walking to and fro. Everyone has someone and a place to go. Listen, hear the cars go, li listen, hear the cars go past. They don't even see me flying by so fast. Moving, going who knows where. Only thing I know is I'm not going there. Where do you go when you, when you feel? Where do you go when you feel? That your brain is on fire. Where do you go when you don't even know what it is you desire? Forgive me. Listen. Laughter everywhere. Hear it. Life is in the air. Children calling and the squeal of brakes. Music, but a lonely song. When you can't help wondering, where do I belong? And you can't help wondering, where do I belong? Oh. Hey, Charles. Can, you, can I get you to? What? Can I get you to stay over? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's. Okay. Hey. My, I, I think it would be better if you stayed over there and we asked questions from here. Um, I, I, I don't know why I it? think that, but... Whatever you say. We, again, well, I mean, that, that was a notable example of what I think uh, was a, a swell song by Lee and me, but had a terrific, uh, we had a terrific time uh, convincing uh, Clifford of it. Another one, uh, again, uh, it, it's not running right now, although there is talk all the time now of a revival of it because there are so many important black musical stars, whereas in Sammy's day, that was it. Sammy was the big uh, star. Uh, I think, uh, uh, if, if it isn't too vulgar to say, uh, Lee and I made more money on that show than we ever did in our lives because Sammy was Jewish and black. So uh, <laughs> we had... <laughs> We, we, uh, we, we toured uh, all over, and it was always the NAACP and uh, the, what is it, the, uh, 
Hadassah that, that, that brought out the name Brett, that brought out the houses. And uh, it, it was just, uh, it was wonderful, although there was a lot of racism in the air. And I will say to Lee's and my credit, uh, although God knows I, I only say it because I really don't believe I need any credit. We were the first show that really had a man, uh, a black man and a white woman, and not merely kiss and touch, and they went to bed together, they did it. And uh, uh, just last week we were in Florida and met the young woman, not so young anymore, who played against Sammy. And uh, uh, they, they sang a passionate love song, uh, one of uh, uh, the uh, favorite ones that uh, uh, Lee and I uh, ever wrote, and, uh, and we got such hate mail, even in the North, when we opened in Philadelphia, we had to have a police escort every night, as did Paula Wayne, who played opposite him. Uh, detectives had to take us back to the hotel because our lives were threatened. See, this meant nothing to me because when I got out of school, I, I played for black acts all the time. I was a, a jazz guy. In spite of the fact that my, my background was a serious one, I could play jazz, I loved jazz, and I played for a lot of uh, black acts in the Deep South. And uh, so it was a non-question to me, and we had an English director at the time, it was a non-question to him. But I cannot tell you how, uh, uh, how often our lives were threatened, uh, both by mail and by uh, phone calls and, and things like that. But as I say, it, 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 if you're going to get a star, get a star who is Jewish and black uh, today. Uh, <laughs> you do good on the theater parties. I say that. Talk about talk about rags a, a bit. I, I, again, off stage, you said it was one of your, if not your favorite. Well, uh, uh, the, uh, rags. I think in some ways, uh, you know, every show. Uh, you do. I, I don't know what you all do, but I assume you're all interested in the theater. But uh, most people who are connected with a school like this and who would bother to come to uh, to hear this and all this, uh, uh, you're, you're you're interested in uh, uh, in the craft a little bit. Uh, it, Rags fascinated me. Rags was a story. See, I've never felt that America, at the beginning, in the times many of our emigrant uh, ancestors, was a melting pot, and it wasn't. Uh, historically speaking, when the Jews came here and the Irish came here, they were segregated and they were, uh, uh, they were mistreated. Uh, uh, Jews lived in, in, in ghettos here. They were a lot better than the ghettos in Europe. Blacks and the Irish lived in a section of New York called the Mud Flats. And I think the only real melting pot, and I've, I've read a great deal about it, was in the music. That's where they melded. melded or, uh, and uh, it fascinated me. And Rags is really about, uh, and that's why maybe it was mistitled uh, in a sense, because when the success of Ragtime happened, uh, people uh, uh, confuse the two. But Rags was about when Irish music and, uh, and black music, you know, there was no tap dancing. This tap dancing, as far as I've read, and I don't know any, anybody who was there, blacks and Irish lived in what they used to call the mud flats. And the Irish did clog dancing, and the blacks did their kind of, you know, I think they called it coon dancing. Then, and before you know it, there was something called tap dancing. Uh, and the same thing with jazz, although blacks, and rightly so, African music is what uh, formed jazz. The, uh, the African, African music has a kind of syncopation and, and non-use of time, but so did klezmer music. Uh, and, and people don't uh, uh, remember, but <laughs> I don't remember either, but I've, I've heard records, recordings of, uh, uh, as long ago as 1915, and uh, they've made them before that, where you hear klezmer music, and I swear the, the, the clarinetist sounds just like Benny Goodman uh, 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 or Cab Calloway or something. It's, it's incredible. And they all met then, and, and that's why Rags fascinated me. And uh, uh, it, it's why I wrote it with uh, Stephen Schwartz, 
who wrote wonderful lyrics for it, and Joe Stein. And uh, we've uh, rewritten it because the critics, uh, it was a huge hit out of town. Is it, you know, this business is so, uh, so mysterious. Rags was one of the biggest hits that we ever had in Boston with basically an Italian and Irish audience. But in New York, with more of a Jewish audience and Jewish critics, uh, they, they carped a great deal about it. Uh, anyway, that's neither here nor there. Uh, it's one of my favorite shows, and I hope it's going to be uh, revived uh, one day. We work on it all the time when we meet, uh, Joe and Stephen and I. Charles, what do you, um, I mean, as a composer, you work with arrangers and uh, various arrangers throughout a show, correct? So, so how do they impact your music, or how do you maintain control of your music when you have to give it over to an arranger? Well, in my case, uh, I write uh, very thorough piano parts, free stave at least, and sometimes four stave. So I indicate uh, 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 every figure. I mean, a well-known figure. Uh, and since it's a show that's running very successfully right now, uh, it, uh, and Bye Bye Birdie, mm -hmm. I mean, I wrote. I did not say to uh, Robert Ginsler, uh, that's got to be two woodwinds, a clarinet, and, uh, and certainly you could put string pizzicatos on that. I did not say that, because this man's an expert orchestrator. But uh, it became uh, part. Now, a lot of people don't understand what an arranger does and an orchestrator does. Robert Ginsler, who orchestrated Bye Bye Birdie, uh, did a brilliant job. Uh, did I arrange that? Yeah, I guess you'd say I did. It goes, um, the, the, you know, the inside of uh, uh, the... Uh, it's very basic kind of stuff, but uh, it, it, it caught the ear. Uh, Bob Ginsler is justifiably given original credit for it. In the new version, uh, what's his name? Jonathan Tunick. <laughs> I'm losing my memory, I'm sorry. Uh, Jonathan Tunick uh, uh, re, you know, revoiced it, rearranged it. They're wonderful orchestrations. Uh, and uh, uh, so the arranger of that, I think if, if one wants to be technical about it, was me. But I never, it, I never asked for that. It, it never occurred to me to ask for that credit. But that's and because it, that's because of your, your skill at the piano. You think what? That's because of the skill of, of yourself at the piano. Well, it's it's my, my background. Uh, I, I just did not write. Gray skies are gonna clear up. Right. Which is possible to do, and maybe somebody could have thought of the other thing. It's just a natural part of me since I play jazz to want to go, gray skies are gonna clear. <laughs> right, right. Et cetera. Uh, but I, I, I got into actually a, a, a lawsuit which had to be settled by a, uh, a man, uh, uh, arbitration, by an, uh, a man who was doing dance music. And he said that, uh, that I used some, some figures that he had written in the recording. Right. And uh, I found it impossible to say to anybody, uh, to a, a learned attorney who was the arbitrator, I, I found it impossible for, uh, for him to understand the difference between arranging, orchestrating, um, uh, modulation, uh, the fact that something was in a different key, right. et cetera. And I lost uh, because he, he didn't understand that what arranging, I mean, I feel, I feel it was actually a non-case, but I could understand mm -hmm. both sides of it, frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what, what else to add. I mean, I, I just happened to play enough piano and, and am an orchestrator partly thanks to the new school. Uh, well, it's true. Yeah, no, I... <laughs> uh, and, uh, it, but it's, it's, it's complicated, but a good uh, orchestrator is, uh, is, is your right arm, sometimes your right and your left arm. Uh, in, 
in the show. Uh, maybe you should ask questions, otherwise I'll keep talking forever. And, uh, I, 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 do you have a question? Oh, well, no, I mean, it's, at some point, I just feel like I need to ask the audience if they'd like to hear a favorite, uh, almost, but... I, I don't hear you as well as you hear well, me. Well, I, I was... I'm going to step over I was here. saying, at some point, I feel like I need to ask the audience if they'd like to hear a favorite, because I, 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 in my own case, I, I, uh, because of the impact that it had on me personally, I'd love to hear both the story and if you're willing to uh, play tomorrow to tell us how that oh, song sure. came be, about. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> uh, he said, uh, you know, a lot of people, I, I spent, uh, after Annie opened, uh, it was amazing how many people uh, uh, came up to me at a party and said, if, if I have to hear my daughter sing that one more time. <laughs> <laughs> one more time. On the, on the other hand, uh, uh, we, uh, oh, I wrote this in my book, if any of you have read it, that uh, uh, they, on the Jerry Lewis telethon, they had one night uh, a girl who, who was uh, crippled with some kind of, uh, you know, uh, a paral a paralysis, infantile paralysis, and she hadn't walked, and Jerry Lewis said, uh, we're going to try something tonight, and a woman came out, I remember she was wearing a sequin gown, which was not totally appropriate, a kind of glamorous looking woman. And she sang, the sun will come out. To me. And, she's, and, we're gonna see, and Jerry Lewis said, we're gonna see what if the inspiration of this song can done. Sure enough, she goes, tomorrow, tomorrow. And this poor little thing, she, <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. I love you, there are always a day. <laughs> and she got up and she, fell into Jerry Lewis's arm. <laughs> I, I, I wrote in the book, I said, I think Martin Charnin and I are going to be elevated to sainthood. Uh, <laughs> uh, because, uh, yes, but the, 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 uh, the, 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 uh, the song itself, uh, which I would be delighted to play for you, uh, came out of a, a very odd series of events. I was working, doing uh, work for an advertising agency and wrote uh, the background score for uh, an industrial film uh, uh, for Arrow Shirts. They were, uh, uh, oh, no, Van Heusen. Uh, and they were, they were having a campaign uh, that they were making a shirt now which uh, youngsters could wear and it would be more hip and all that. And so in this score, I had a small vocal group uh, at a time when he was talking about, you know, you, you're really going to look young. And in the, in the group, uh, uh, I just used a little bit of a tune. Uh, and, I can't re and I wrote the words to it that when uh, uh, you want to feel young, two days in, da 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 and it, it, it was just a little, it was just a little uh, a bit. Uh, years later, interestingly enough, uh, 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 Tom Meehan, who wrote uh, the show with us, Annie, uh, went backstage to, what's his name, Billy, uh, the uh, comedian Billy Crystal. 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 Billy Crystal. Yeah. And it, it seems that he was in that group, in that vocal group that sang it. <laughs> But it was, anyway, it was not only written for another purpose, but it was also, uh, though we knew we wanted a song of inspiration, it was written to kill a minute and a half to two minutes because Martin Charnin, who directed it, had a wonderful set change. Uh, there, were, there were posters of... Uh, you know, the depression and things. She originally, Annie, got beaten up by some tough kids and, uh, and found this dog, Sandy, had a scene with the cop, and the next thing was to be the cop arrests her and walks her, and they were in the uh, orphanage. But there was no time for the set change, so we needed a song, two and a half, three minutes. So it was, it, it was meant to be a song of inspiration, but I never, I thought, the first time it was done, I thought, uh, 
I went back to Martin, I said, that is the greatest scene change. Do you hear the applause on that? Uh, uh, and, and believed it for uh, uh, quite a few months. But anyway, uh, it, it, it became bigger than itself. And uh, the sun will come out tomorrow. Bet your bottom dollar that tomorrow there'll be sun just thinking about tomorrow clears away the cobwebs and the sorrow till there's none when I'm stuck with a day that's gray and lonely I just stick out my chin and grin and say oh the sun will come out tomorrow so you gotta hang on till tomorrow come what may tomorrow tomorrow I love you tomorrow you're always a day away when I'm stuck with a day that's gray and lonely I just stick out my chin and grin and say oh, oh, oh. <laughs> the sun will come out tomorrow so you gotta hang on till tomorrow come what may tomorrow 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 sorry Barbara tomorrow I love you tomorrow you're always a day away tomorrow tomorrow I love you tomorrow you're always a day My, uh, forgive me, I, I got lost in the middle of the heart, and I look at my wife and goes, oh. <laughs> <laughs> like that. And it's my own fault. I was, uh, didn't pr I practice today. I'm an, I'm, uh, there are cards out there, but you may just want to stand up and shout out a request or something. I mean, oh, uh, please. Uh, I, and one of the things I was struck by in reading your book, uh, 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 and your, as you say, essentially, you're a happy person. Yeah. And, um, essentially. Essentially, yeah. Right. <laughs> and I'm, 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 I'm curious about that because you're a child of the Depression. I mean, the 30s were not the greatest time uh, uh, to come of age. My father, uh, my father, yes, was a real Depression child. I was a Depression man. He, he lived in Harlem. He walked to work in Wall Street to save a nickel. Uh, and uh, I grew up with that. A feeling of uh, you know deprivation is around the corner. Yeah. So where did the happiness come from? I mean, people a lot. Of, I mean, really, I mean, a lot of people that I know that grew up in the '30s and have come out, come out of that experience a lot happier than people that grew up in better times. But what's well, going on? Well, I don't know. I mean, I I, I talk about my wife a, a lot, but uh, I mean, a great deal comes from her. Uh, she had a very very tough childhood. Uh, I mean, for one thing, she came from New Jersey. <laughs> uh, 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 
you know, I don't, I, I don't know. I was not a happy child. Uh, my, my parents did not get along. My mother was a severe depressive uh, who was uh, committed uh, late uh, in her midlife uh, to a uh, hospital. And uh, uh, it was not what I would call a, a, a it was a great marriage. But I, I was very, very lucky. I hope, I don't sound sentimental because I'm not at all a sentimental person, but uh, my, my wife uh, uh, has made, we have, uh, <laughs> we have four wonderful kids. Well, three and a half, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful children. They're all uh, delightful. They're smart. They're creative. Uh, I feel like the beginning of in, any of you have seen Birdie. You know, I have one, four wonderful kids, and now this, Ed Sullivan. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, publicly, I'm, I'm delighted to, uh, to say that about her. A, a man is very lucky if he has a, a good wife. And uh, this sounds too sentimental for the... Uh, the occasion, but uh, I would say that, you know, she's done, she's done that for me. Do you think you... <laughs> but do, do you think your, your composing, your music, uh, would have been different if, you'd have been, if you were born in 1980, let's say? Uh, does oh, it well, have, I does think it... I'd be much more rock-oriented. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, seriously, I, uh, uh, a great deal of the rock period, which, uh, you know, Bertie was about the rock, uh, but more rockabilly, uh, it, not the, uh, <coughs> the hard rock. I, I think, uh, yes, and if I had, uh, you know, when I was studying in Paris, uh, that had I, to be great. What? That was the 50s? Uh, I think it was the 50s, yeah. yeah. Uh, or 60s, I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, uh, I, uh, I had the opportunity and, you know, to have dope every once in a while. But coming from the background that I did, my parents being middle class and all, I never took to it. And I think if I had taken to it more, I would have been a, a, a you know, a rock guy. You kind of get out of it. But I was always, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know whether my religion, I'm not religious, not at all, but that's beside the point. But I think the fact that I came from, uh, uh, a mother and father of solid middle class values uh, stopped me. Uh, also, I don't have the hair for it. Uh, um, but uh, I, I never went into a, a, a rock because of that age. You know, one of the things that, that strikes me about, particularly New York and the, and the uh, such as I know of the music scene, I was sort of, an, again, an example the other evening when we had this. Uh, book party for David Lehman and his, his uh, book is called The Fine Romance and the young woman who was playing the piano is from Japan and uh, she's been in New York City for eight years and her, the music genre she plays is reggae so yeah. I'm, 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 it, it, I'm, it's, it's interesting it, to me how you tend to pigeonhole an artist and then when they begin to perform, they just break right out of it. I'm it's uh, in internationally because of uh, recordings and the way of sending music over the internet and all, it's, it's become true, pop music is truly international now. Is there, is there anything about the current music genre that's appealing to you? I mean, do you, are oh. you is there any? <coughs> yeah, uh, you know, like most people, I fell for the Beatles uh, and uh, but I was into uh, I was into uh, country music and uh, uh, and jazz before the Beatles. Uh, uh, we we met. Uh, I don't know whether this, this is germane to what you asked, but I mean uh, there was a whole. We uh, we knew Paul McCartney in London when we were there, and uh, one night. Uh, uh, he knew nothing about American musicals at all. He was fascinated by them. And he and his uh, wife at the time uh, were Barbara's and my guests to see applause, which proudly was sold out. And I was able to pull <laughs> strings. And, and, and we sat there. And, and after one song, he, uh, he turned to us and he said, did you write that song? I said, yeah. 
he said, and then he'd say, and that one too? I said, yeah, I wrote all these songs. <laughs> <laughs> he, I don't know whether he was putting me on. I mean, That's I was, good. Uh, was he? Uh, he, was he was putting yeah. me on. No, he was serious. Yeah, I thought he was serious too. I mean, he, he really didn't know that the, that, the, that the musical involved one guy writing all those songs. <laughs> Where, where do you think the musical will be 10, 15, 20 years from now? Oh, I, I hope I'll have a big hit. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I, I don't mean to be uh, uh, facetious. I, 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 I don't know. It's a very, Broadway particularly, which everyone says is the musical. Well, it really isn't. People are doing things in opera and small theaters and, and uh, uh, dance companies. Uh, Broadway's a very... Uh, hard to describe entity. It was built originally around uh, tired businessmen and and uh, half naked girls and uh, a largely Jewish audience, and it became the gay white way. And it influenced the world. And the British were dancing to American jazz and and uh, black tap dancers. And today Broadway has retained a, uh, a, a magic hold on the world. And I, I, I remember most fondly the fact when applause did open, uh, the very next day on, the, on, the, uh, on a billboard backstage, uh, th they had a paper from uh, Hong Kong. The banner headline said, Lauren Bacall triumphs on Broadway. Uh, well, when you stop and think of it, what makes Broadway, which I'm very proud and happy to, uh, you know, participated in, uh, what makes it that? I mean, it is true that every set designer in Indiana uh, or uh, Detroit wants to come to New York, where if something is successful, it, su it seems to, uh, to reflect success all over the world. I mean, I, I say it's wonderful. On the other hand, I don't, I don't totally understand it. Uh, Do you think, I mean, it's like, you know, it's $15 million to put on a musical now. Do you yeah. think that'll continue in the future? Or do you think there'll be a new business model? Or do you think that you'll get the orchestra, or the 20-piece orchestra back? I mean, how do you think it'll change or morph into the future? Well, uh, as far as getting the 20-piece, or 23-piece, actually, orchestra back, <laughs> I think probably not, because, you know, the people who own theaters uh, and who produce shows, they're real estate people. They, they, they play it very tight uh, to, to the vest. Uh, I don't think it'll be all synthesizers, because uh, people really appreciate, you know, the guy going like this and hearing me. Uh, the timpani, uh, but uh, it's becoming, uh, well, you guys read the same papers. I, it's become much more star-driven. Right. Uh, it's become, uh, uh, you know, it, it's very tourist-driven. We always had tourists, but I don't remember anything like this. You go on a Thursday night, you go below 50th Street, you cannot move through the sea of Germans and Japanese and, and people from uh, uh, Indiana and, you know, it, it, it's just... Uh, <laughs> not personal. No, I just, I just love the association. Yeah. <laughs> Does anybody in the audience want to ask for something? Yes. Um, first, I'd like to say I read your book and thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. I was wondering if you thought maybe your own life story might make an interesting Broadway music. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> we just can't get the right guy to play me. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I'm so flattered by the question, I can't take it seriously. But, uh, it, uh, I think it's probably been done. I mean, the, uh, the only difference was that my mother had a lot of uh, mental problems and... Uh, but uh, 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 but thank you for the for the compliment. I appreciate it. Yes. I was thinking about the uh, two movies that were based on Annie, the John Huston version, and then later on the Rob Marshall version, done for TV. And they're both very different, using the same source material. I was wondering if you could talk about the experiences on both those projects. 
Well, the, the experience with the, mu the musical that uh, John Huston directed was a really weird one for us uh, because uh, I have no idea who said, oh, John Huston, yeah. Uh, and uh, it turned out we weren't far from wrong. He, we saw one scene, they wouldn't let us on the set for one thing. There was a man by the name of Ray Stark who uh, bought the, uh, the, uh, the show and he, uh, I don't think he knew what it was, was about, but they paid us so money, so much money, which my wife thought we were uh, silly to take. Uh, but, uh, well, she said, she said, somehow you guys ought to do this yourselves. But, uh, you know, when, you, when you've worked that long, it took us eight years to get it uh, uh, done. And then they, uh, and it was done. It was a big hit. They paid us $10 million. And I didn't feel like going back and working on it again. Uh, so we didn't like that film, and they didn't like us. And uh, <laughs> seriously, we, we had to threaten them once to, to get on the set. And, and I knew a lot of the people on the set, uh, and they still wouldn't let us come on. And uh, it was just, uh, it was misconceived. Uh, Rob Marshall is brilliant, and he did it uh, better than I've ever seen it done. And uh, there has been uh, an offer, again, from Columbia uh, to uh, re re reshoot it, which I'm, I'm very proud about. I'm hoping it happens soon. And, uh, it, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky that, uh, you know, I, I, I started out writing music. I still love doing it that I get paid as well as I have been uh, is a stroke of good fortune and I can understand why any young writer, as I used to be, wouldn't want the same thing to happen. When I was playing jazz uh, or, or the dance music at the, uh, at the plaza or something, you know, I, I, was, uh, I used to play in society bands and, and, uh, and played in strip joints and all that. I thought, boy, someday, would I love to have a uh, show on Broadway? Wow. Well, it, there's a lot to the glamour of it. But as I started to say, I don't get it, except that we all seem to want to go to see it, thank goodness. And uh, uh, why it is so glamorous, I don't know. Yes. Mr. Strauss, what do you think of the film version of Bye My Birdie and the television version of Bye My Birdie? Uh, the television version of, of Bye Bye Birdie was very accurate, but somehow I thought it lost a, uh, a spark. You know, uh, for some reason, it's so interesting, the role of Rosie. Today, we are loaded. You can't walk out of your building without bump, bumping into a gorgeous Spanish girl. Uh, but for some reason, uh, at that time, uh, as far as the film is concerned, uh, they said, where are we going to get an actor to play a Spanish girl? Well, there were plenty of them around, but the only one they could think of was uh, a Janice, what's her name? Janet Who played in Birdie? Janet Lee. Janet Lee, uh, who was as Spanish as the man who just asked that question. <laughs> uh, on, t on top of which, uh, when I, I, it was our first experience. Uh, I, uh, uh, she had just been divorced from Tony Curtis. She was very, sorrowful for the whole thing. Uh, I write about that a lot in the book because we'd never been to Hollywood before. I, I thought I could make her fall in love with me to do the truth. Uh, well, it was a fantasy. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, it, was, it was a very uh, interesting and unnerving experience. And uh, uh, they paid us, a, you know, we got paid a lot of money. Uh, I've sent, uh, we have sent four kids through college. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> yes, back there. Hi, uh, I was wondering what the experience was like uh, learning an American movement, and also I was wondering if you could play Once Upon a Time. Yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah, I, I'd be delighted to, uh, uh, yes, a Aaron was a, uh, a huge influence in my life. He was a, uh, I worked with him at Tanglewood uh, for three years and then worked with him afterwards privately. Uh, he was a very 
giving man who uh, was very strict about being not strict, if you know what I mean. That is, he encouraged you to, uh, he would hear things in your music and encourage you to go in that direction rather than, but only encouraged you. He, he very rarely used uh, uh, negative uh, psychology. Uh, he had no ax to grind. He was swamped at a certain point in his career by the incursion of uh, atonal music, European composers and American composers too, who uh, uh, made a cult out of uh, uh, the Schoenbergian uh, school. And uh, he, there was a point in his life where he started to feel very much out of it. He was very sad and then uh, decided to do something about it and changed his own style and wrote some very, very dissonant uh, music, which uh, is very fine, but was never as popular as Appalachian Spring. He, uh, he was a very good man. He was a, an avowed, well, I wouldn't say avowed, nobody was avowed then, but he was a well-known homosexual uh, in, the, in the time when nobody admitted it. And uh, so as far as my relationship with him, it was circumspect. Uh, uh, he was always, I felt kind of veiled, and I think that was probably one of the reasons, but he was one of the most generous, knowledgeable uh, uh, teachers I'd ever worked with. And uh, uh, I think he was proud of me, he didn't know I, I wrote jazz. I mean, he certainly approved of it because he wrote jazz early in his career too. But he called me once and said that there was a, uh, he knew me as Buddy. See, everyone called me Buddy. And he called me once when he came back to this country from London and said that there was a show on on Broadway who's uh, uh, the composer who had the same spelling and his last name, as I did, uh, what was that? I think he knew. See, that was the kind of person he was. He wouldn't, you know, come right out and accuse me of it. Uh, but uh, I, yeah, I said, no, that's mine. He was very, very p pleased, very proud of me. And, and uh, I, I can dare say I love him. I, I did an opera out in, uh, in Detroit. And uh, though I wasn't there at the time, uh, Aaron was there lecturing or something. And, my wife told me that he went and said that it's a student of mine, you know, he was very proud of me. And uh, I, I really liked him very much. I can't say I loved him because he never really uh, was able to let me get close. I'm sure, I know he had a lot of very close friends and I think the, the, uh, the homosexual part of it was, uh, was part of it, but uh, I, I'm, I was crazy about him. Once upon a time, a girl with moonlight in her eyes put her hand in mine and said she loved me so. But that was once upon a time, very long ago. Once upon a hill We sat beneath the willow tree Counting all the stars And waiting for the dawn But that was once upon a time Now the tree is gone How the breeze ruffled through her hair How we always laughed as though tomorrow wasn't there We were young and didn't have a care Where did it go? 
once upon a time the world was sweeter than we knew everything was ours how happy we were then but somehow once upon a time never comes again Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, uh, I also want to ask, do you have any, do they really have any intentions of bringing Golden Boy back to Broadway? It's been, it hasn't been here since 64, which is when I was born. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, do you have any real intentions of bringing it back? I, I have all the intentions in the world, but uh, we don't have a, uh, frankly, a star. There was a moment in time where, uh, I can't remember his name now, a very well known, a kind of rock pop guy, Usher, Usher. Usher uh, professed an interest in it. it. It became a newspaper rumor and nothing more. And uh, there are some agents. Uh, we had, we own the rights, but the uh, Clifford's uh, part of it has been given to his children naturally, and his children now have an agent. Uh, which they didn't have, we were free to, to work with it. Now there's a certain uh, business uh, uh, connection which we have to go through. And frankly, the agency, the agent, uh, is not as uh, flexible as we would like to be. Uh, and I suppose justifiably so, but if everything could get cleared away, it would be cleared away in a minute, by the way, if there were this actor, because it's all, in the Sammy Davis part, that is a. What? There's some stars out there waiting. Oh, he's auditioning. Yeah, but believe, <laughs> believe me, I, I I would love it to happen. I I I know there are ways to rewrite it. It was a little bit uh, pon, pontifical, uh, the way Bill Gibson wrote it. You know, there were it it, it was a show that all that had to do with. Uh, with uh, the, the views about blacks and whites, which is so subtly intertwined and, and, uh, and people disregard their own minds. Bill Gibson was, was uh, very much the liberal. Uh, Sammy wanted to say the right thing. Uh, I, I say very proudly, um, uh, Martin Luther King came to see it three times and uh, told me that uh, uh, his favorite song, uh, was a song called No More in it, uh, but it did not become the anthem as did We Shall Overcome. But I was very proud of the fact that King liked it. Uh, and uh, I would love it. I think, it's, I think it's a wonderful play. I think uh, Lee and I could do it better and you know, cut out a lot of some preaching in it. And, uh, and the love story was fantastic. Thank you. Any other guests? Yes, Mr. Krauss, um, you said that uh, the book was relatively easy to write, but still there had to be a process in writing the book. You know, did you just go to the computer and start writing about your life or dictate it to someone and then you edited it? No. I, 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 I sat down at a computer. It started actually from a time like this, uh, the years before, where I was playing and uh, uh, recounted some stories about Bacall and, and uh, uh, things like that. And, and there was an agent in the, who had heard the concert. She said, you ought to put those things down in a book. And I said, Okay, uh, what do I do? And she said, uh, she said, write 40 pages, and uh, and send them to me, and 
uh, I'll make this a short story. I wrote 40 pages, I sent it to her, uh, and I, I never heard again. And uh, so I didn't know what to do. I didn't have an agent. I knew a couple of agents, but when I told them it was what it was about, nobody uh, answered a call. And it was uh, when, uh, uh, what made it happen? Oh yeah, I, I looked in, uh, <laughs> I was just you know on the internet. I looked up a, a literary agents and uh, I Googled. And the first one I Googled, uh, I spoke to her on the phone, and she sounded very nice, and I told her, and actually she came over to my house and showed her the book, and she sold it. It was, it was that simple, but through all uh, the contacts, and I had a lot of contacts through agencies, and I knew a couple of really big, big time ones, uh, it never got to their desk. Uh, but uh, through the inter internet, it's very funny. I didn't know this woman, I didn't know whether she was any good, but she, uh, she sold it to Barnes and Noble. In fact, she had three other, two other offers. That could have been a very unhappy ending, by the way. But I'm glad it had a happy ending. You <laughs> went on the internet. And... I'm sorry. You, you wrote it yourself. What? She asked if you wrote it yourself. Oh yes, I wrote it myself, and I did what you first suggested. I sat down at the computer and remembered, which is easier to do when there are shows involved. You know, it's like writing the First World War, the Second World War, the Third World War. <laughs> Uh, uh, there was, you know, I'm, I'm never going to forget what it was like working with Gower Champion uh, because the show uh, became established and, and all of that. No, I just wrote it and, and uh, I didn't do anything. I, I, didn't, I tried not to say anything bad about anything, anybody uh, because most of the people, I, I've had a very fortunate life. I had a bad experience with Arthur Lawrence and I could not resist putting down a couple of jabs at him. But we ended up uh, friends. And at least I think so. He doesn't think so. <laughs> One last question. I just wanted to ask how long you took. How long did it take to write the book? Um, I would say about a, about a year. I, I don't remember. I think it was a year. But I, I you know, uh, I'm in the position in my life, very fortunately, was A, I love working, and B, I now have a, my, you know, my own time and space to work. Uh, you know, I didn't have to, you know, go down to the uh, garage. <laughs> <laughs> Martin Mueller, do you have a question? Yes. I was wondering if you would do some kind of some jazz for us. I'm, I'm sorry. Did you wonder if you'd play some jazz? Oh well, I, 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 I'm not so uh, I'm not so polished in it, but I, uh, on, uh, uh, sure I don't mind. But I don't know whether you'd want to hear. It. There's so many fine jazz pianists around. But I mean, I, I can just show you that. I mean, what? You know, I mean, it's it's like saying to. Uh, uh, to somebody, you know, do a dance and, and uh, <laughs> uh. That's, that's, uh...
<laughs> I, 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 thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, our, our evening is over. I'm going to thank Charles Strauss. Barbara, thank you for coming as well. And my thanks to the audience as well. Good evening. <laughs>